Episode 154 of the 4x4 podcast is brought to you by Artemis Overland Hardware. Artemis Overland Hardware is a family business with a huge selection of Overland equipment in stock for online orders, or you can visit the showroom located in Springfield, Missouri. Either way, Artemis Overland Hardware will get you equipped and ready for all your adventures, wherever they may take you. You're listening to the 4x4 podcast. The podcast all about four-wheeling, overlanding, off-road racing, and the outdoor lifestyle. We talk about news, tips and tricks, answer your questions, and interview big and little names in the off-roading world. So whether your rig is busted and you're in the shop wrenching on it, or you're on your way to the trail, join us and we'll keep you plugged in on topics to help you get away. Here are your hosts, Dan, Craig, and Rich. Well, hello. Thanks for coming back for another episode of the 4x4 podcast. And this episode is going to be a little bit different format than usual. Uh, Craig and Rich are not going to be joining us for this episode uh, because we have a a pretty lengthy interview that I'd like to share with you. This one is long overdue. Uh, You may be familiar with the name brand LT Wright Knives. Uh, They were a uh, sponsor of the show a while back, uh, and I still continue to use the LT Wright knife that I have, and I have a number of their other models that I have the Genesis, uh, but like the Machete and some of the others are on my wish list and have been for a while. Uh, so this is long overdue. I want to share, you know, the interview here with LT himself. Uh, a lot of fascinating stories, and you know, odds are. You're interested in knives as well. Uh, There just seems to be a natural overlap, and we talk about that a little bit in this interview. Uh, But without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump to that interview. Today on the podcast, we have a very special guest, one that I've been looking forward to having on the show for a long time and uh, long, long overdue. Uh, Today, we are going to be joined by the one and only LT from LT Right Knives. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, this is long overdue. We'd been meaning to have you or some of the other team members on the show uh, to talk about LT Right Knives and kind of help make me smart uh, with the, you know, all the different kinds of blades and the the grinds on them. I know that all means something, but you know, I. Right. I don't know a ton about it, uh, but before we get into talking about that, can you kind of walk us in? How did uh, LT Wright Knives get started? Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, back in uh, probably about 2000, a friend of mine invited me to go to a gun show. He's a guy I shot with a lot. You know, we had a good time shooting and something. He said, hey, I want to go over this gun show. Well, I'd always been into knives, actually, you know, my whole life. Grew up hunting with my dad and stuff, and we kind of uh, always fell into always liking a, a knife, so I... One Christmas, got a buck, uh, what was it, a 124. It's the big Rambo-looking thing. Oh, yeah. You know, about 14 years old. Before that, I used to have an old butcher knife. Uh, it was a herder's catalog knife that I used to run around the woods, you know, the Tarzan thing when you're a kid. Always had a love for knives, uh, whether it be tactical hunting. I, probably more like the hunting and outdoors were always kind of my thing for, for knives. So always had a love for knives, had a decent collection of a bunch of different kinds. Uh, generally at that time, um, stuff you could get, again, we're talking pre-internet, so it wasn't easy, you know, (laughs) just sitting around and maybe either getting something out of a catalog or at your local, uh, well, we didn't have Walmarts then, we, uh, Kmarts or, you know, the box stores or, or just some of the hunting stores that we had around here. And I can remember as a kid, just laying on the floor, looking through the old field and stream magazines or outdoor life. You know, my dad's in the recliner on a Sunday reading a book and I'm just thumbing through there, not even looking at the stories. I'm looking at the ads for knives. And I can remember it was like five bucks and you could get a Marine K bar, you know, and the old magazine oh, yeah. ads. And I was just, I'd sit there. It was like the, the Sears catalog. When you were a kid, you're just sitting there dreaming of these knives. Yeah. And it was a really cool thing. So in 2000, yeah, right, in, right, right around in 2000, a friend of mine goes, hey, there's a gun show up here. Would you like to go? And I was like, heck yeah, let's go up and check it out. So I went up there and I'm, you know, walking around the room looking at the vendors. And I came across this table that had a bunch of tomahawks on it and some really, really cool knives that I'd never seen anything like this before. And I'm just standing there. I'm kind of going, man, is this really cool? I would so love to learn how to make do that or, you know, how to make knives. And the guy behind the table goes, well, I can show you. And I looked up, and here's, here's a guy in fringe, 
He's got like a buckskin shirt on and a top hat. I'm like, wow, this guy's kind of cool, right? So I find out his name is R.W. Wilson. And if you've never seen his knives and tomahawks, he is definitely something to check out. So rwwilson.com, check him out. Okay. So he says, he said, he said to me, he says, hey, man, I, you know, I'll show you how to make knives. I was like, cool. He says, well, come on over tonight and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get something going. I was like, all right, that's kind of cool. You know, we, we got this started. Um, so I, you know, talked to my wife about it. And I used to work at a stair shop. And when I'd get off at, in the evening time, I would go over to RW's and watch him make knives just about every night of the week until he got tired. And then I'd come home, get up, go to work, and did that thing. So learning how to make knives was kind of watching him. Well, the really cool thing was the first time I go over there, I, I opened the door, you know, knocked, he let me in. He, we're walking through and there's this array of tomahawks on the, the wall of the family room there. And I said, oh man, those are really cool. What, what's that all about? He goes, oh, those are the tomahawks I made for the movie Jeremiah Johnson in the 70s. Oh, no I'm way. Like, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> you know, I thought that my tra- it was nothing to him. He kept on walking to the shop. I'm standing there with my mouth open looking as like, this is one of my favorite movies of all times. And this is the guy that made the tomahawk. I just kind of like, you know, died and went to heaven. I was like, <laughs> you guys how to make knives. How cool is that? Right. Yeah. I was just tickled to death. And I, I, he lives 10 minutes from me still to this day. <laughs> I mean, he lives just across the river. He's that close to me. It's so cool. So, oh man, that started such a good thing. And, and God bless RW because he, I had a lot of dumb questions. You know, I, I didn't know a thing about, I was a carpenter by trade. Yeah. Have anything to do with metal and stuff, man, that was all new to me. Yeah. You know, this, this was like a fish out of water kind of thing. It was a whole different thing. But because I was a trim carpenter and a high end stair builder and stuff at that time, I, I felt like I had a real good fit and finish and a good eye for, for finish. Sure. So, so I was really pleased about that. Well, he's, he, he uh, spent a lot of time answering a lot of my questions. And then he would invite me to go to shows with him. So not only did he teach me how to make the actual physical knife, I got to travel with him, hear all the stories from the old days, you know, when he came up with um, Bob Loveless and how they got the guild started years ago. Some really cool stuff. And then, you know, he goes all over the U.S. for shows. But I got to travel with him. But not only did I learn how to make the knives, but I also got the opportunity to learn how to sell them and to deal with people and watch how he interacted with the public when they would ask questions like, Hey, what, what's the best steel? Hey, is this going to stay sharp? Hey, is this going to rust? You know, and I'm starting to see how the interaction goes and seeing what people like. So I would go home and at the time I would go to gun shows and I would buy old knives, take them home, bust the handles off of them, clean them up, regrind them, put new handles on, and then, you know, do my practicing kind of like that. Yeah. So that's one of the ways that I practice. So he spent a lot of time, uh, showed me how to make knives, and then I finally got to do some stuff in the shop. So he let me cut some blanks out for him, and he'd be over there doing stuff, and I'd look over his shoulder and you know try to catch a, a glimpse of stuff. And then finally he let me get on the grinder and, and rough grind some stuff, and then he'd move me out of the way and fix it. You know? <laughs> but it was a it was a great experience. Uh, I dearly love the man. He taught me a lot of stuff. I, I see him still even now, and then. he'll come over to the shop sometimes and hang out for a while. Um, but he's still he's still out there making knives. He's still out there traveling. He's retired from the still mill, and he, he just does a lot of stuff. But I was very blessed to have him as the guy that showed me. Now, the way the company kind of evolved from there was I had made my father a kit knife, which is a knife that's already ground, and it's hardened. So you can buy the, the blank. Well, I bought it from a, a knife warehouse out in Columbus at the time and put my own handles on it and did some stuff. And I printed it. It was a gift for my dad for Christmas. Mm-hmm. Well, he ended up taking it to work. And then the next thing I know, he comes in and goes, hey, I got some buddies that would like to have one of these. And I'm like, well, I, I don't make knives. You know, I <laughs> said, this is a kid knife. I bought it and I just did some of the finished work and, and put it together. He's like, no, nah, man, they're really, you know, they're willing to, to buy these knives. I'm like, oh, okay. So I can't remember exactly how many it was, but I always like to say there was about 10 of them because I made these, sold them to his friends and superintendents on the job through through my dad doing it. And that is what allowed me to get the money to buy my first grinder, which R.W. Wilson built for me. So <laughs> that's kind of how I got my start. Now, if, you know, for those who are listening that know me, 
one of the rules my wife set out for me when I started this new hobby was <laughs> no house money because I've had muscle cars. I've had the four wheel drives, guns, oh yeah, guitars, amps. I have spent, you know, <laughs> your toy money on tons and tons of stuff. Oh, yeah. So she's like, hey, this is this new hobby you think you're going to go do over here. You got to no house money for that. You know, you got to make the stuff and sell it. I was like, oh, man. OK, so <laughs> this is a hobby that off. has to pay for itself. <laughs> yeah. And as as a guy, you know, that's not an easy thing to no, do. No, it is not. We, we definitely know how to put the money into the product and then usually sell it for way less than it's worth. Oh, yeah. I can turn anything into a bottomless pit of money. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Same way. Well, see, in the, in the early days when I used to make knives, it would literally take me about a week to make a knife. I was just downstairs every night after work, and I would just mess with knives and mess with knives. I'd have umpteen hours in them. Then I'd go to a gun show on Saturday. And, you know, her rule was I couldn't spend any money. So it was like, well, I got to sell this knife to buy another piece of steel to make another knife. Well, I was just kind of figured it as my education. So I wasn't really out to make money. I was out to get a little bit of money so I could buy another piece yeah. of steel, another knife to make a little bit more money. So that's kind of how I, I put all that together. And it actually worked. I would go to the gun shows and I'd come home at the end of the day and go, well, hey, they like my stuff. Some guys bought some knives today. This is really cool. You know, especially when you're doing something that you like and yeah. then someone else likes it enough to give you some money for it. Man, I was I was like, this is kind of cool. I really like this. And, you know, one thing led to another. All of a sudden I ended up I'm taking orders now. Right. And I'm still working. And I got a, I got a daughter in school. My wife, you know, I'm regular Joe. I got a house payment. I got a car payment. I got all this stuff going on. Well, now I'm in the shop until late at night to where she's coming down. Hey, it's bedtime. Shut the grind <laughs> off. Let's go. Because I, I put a little shop under my front porch in sure. my basement. You know, she's hearing the noise and some of the dust <laughs> and all that. So that was that was a lot of fun early on. But now here I am. I'm, I'm getting up at 430, going to work, and then I'm in the shop till 1030 at night, 11. You know, you get your shower yeah. in by 11, 1130, up again at 430. And then on weekends... I'm running out the door to a local gun show to, to sell my wares, right? Loving it, though. Don't get me wrong. This is absolutely a good time. I was younger then, too. You know? <laughs> just, just a tad more energy. Sure. But but it was a really good time. So we got that all started. Well, I'm sitting here, and I got all of a sudden, I got I got orders backing up. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is really cool. And I kind of said to her, I said, you know, I think I can do this for a living. I, I think we can do this. And honest to goodness, she never said, nope, this is stupid. Don't you dare. Da, da, da. Now, now remember, I'm just making a few knives and making a little money on the weekends at this right. time. I'm just working a lot because it's taking me a week to build a knife because I, I don't, you know, I haven't figured that all out yet. But she's like, okay, I think you can. Honest to goodness, she never yeah. said, no way. Sounds pretty smart and probably see, uh, you know, there, where there's smoke, there's flames and there's plenty of smoke there. Man, I'll tell you, God bless her because it wasn't easy, but she was there supportive and still to this day, she is supportive. You That's know, outstanding. She's up right now doing data entry so that I can talk to you on the, <laughs> on the podcast. But we were so blessed and, and, and I um, gave my two weeks notice and went doing this full time. And it was like pretty much, she had a job at the time and I would make knives Monday through Friday we would jump in the Jeep on Friday night and drive to a knife show somewhere. Most of the time we would sleep in a tent at a fairgrounds or at a campsite. Uh, we'd either, you know, if we had electric, we'd have our hot pot. If not, we'd have our jet boil. So we were set up for kind of a camping weekend. And then during the day we were over at the gun show, whatever the venue may have been doing our thing. And then going to camping at night and then packing up on Sunday, coming home. And I was back in the shop Monday morning, you know, the, the biggest thing for me when I turned it from hobby into business was don't get lazy and go, oh, I, I work for myself now. I don't, yeah. I can go here in the afternoon and do that. Nope. Yep. I still got up early. I still hit it all day long, you know, and then still had to get right after it. And that's how we kind of got the, the company off the ground. And this would have been, I think 2005 or right, right around there is when I went full time. Um, 
about a year after that, after we'd, we'd have her, had everything going and we're running back and forth and it was a big struggle, you know, anything starting a new business. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs out there can attest to this. It's not an easy process. There's a lot of times that I spent time in my shop looking at my stuff going, man, are you sure about this? You know, but then that other side of me went, yeah, you got it, man. This, yeah. is, this is it. You love knives. You want to be here. You want to do this. This is it. Just let, let's stay the course. Let's get focused and, and stay on it. I did a lot of um, positive self-talk to keep me going in the early days because the money wasn't coming in as, yeah. as, as you'd hope. You know, regular jobs gone. Here, here was the thing. When I quit my job, that paycheck stopped that Friday. Yeah. Come next Friday, it's 100% up to me. There's no company writing me a check anymore. This is, man, I got to have this Saturday on the table so that I can get a guy to buy that so I can get a paycheck and buy groceries. It, it was, you know, it was, it was tough. It was a lot of work. And God bless my wife, Elaine, for being there because, I mean, it was a huge, huge part of the company. Yeah, Her I'm sure. Got to have the support, man. Family, Absolutely. whatever you got, you got to have that support. There is no doubt about it. So we got we got that going really really well. Um, and then I had a business partner, and we started a company called Blind Horse Knives. And I was very happy and proud of Blind Horse Knives for a lot of years. And when we decided to, to dissolve the company and kind of go our own way, and and he's still making knives too. Uh, we just took the original name back, LT Wright Knives. And today we've been doing this uh, for a, quite a while now, and we're blessed. We have about twelve people that work with us, and I know you know Mike and, and Scott. They're big, yep. they're four wheel guys or four wheel drive guys too. And uh, yeah, man, we're just we're having a great great time. I am a blessed person to be able to work with a bunch of good guys, and we get to make knives. I mean, come on, that's, <laughs> that's kind of cool, right. Yeah. Well, there's definitely a, a natural overlap between uh, people that like knives and off-roading because it's just, I guess, yes. where adventure converges. It involves both things a lot of times. Uh, it does, I think, because uh, and sometimes because, it, like you said, with the off-roading, camping kind of is a part of that almost yeah. automatically, right? For most, sometimes, for most. sometimes by default, if the uh, off-roading doesn't go good, it turns into a camping trip. <laughs> there, there you go. Exactly. And uh, it was really cool because uh, I always did like the wheel a little bit, but Mike and Scott really kind of pushed me a little bit more into that arena. And um, I remember Mikey sitting around. He used to say to me, hey, there's this thing called Expo West. Now, this is this is years ago, right? Sure. And it was a small thing back then. And I was like, oh man, that, that'd be kind of cool. I'm digging it. I, you know, sport mobiles. Who can not like a four wheel drive van? Those oh, I know. Cool, right? So I'm like, man, yeah, I want to go out there and do this. Well, here, all of a sudden they have an Expo East. And Mike says, hey, they have an Expo East. Now we're there. We're going to set up as vendors. We got to go. Yeah. So we went down our first year and set up and we were so well received by those guys. Man, we had such a great time. Got to know a bunch of the overlanders and the, the wheelers and the Land Rover guys. I mean, Jeep guys, you name it. And they all come together in this really cool community about just four-wheel drive camping, I guess, and, and overlanding. And I thought, man, this is just a blast. This is a, this is a fun thing to do. <laughs> so we end up now, we got an, uh, uh, an adventure-style trailer that we take with us. Uh, I have a built Jeep, and I say built because now there's stuff that's been done to it. Uh, <laughs> Scott's got a, a nice Toyota. My nephew Sammy's got a built Toyota. I got a buddy Andy with a built Scout. Uh, Grant's got a built Toyota. There's there's some buddies. Mikey's working on a Land Rover. So we got some buddies, and and we we like messing with our trucks, and we like to go camping. And we've done a lot of trips now. We've done Expo East, Expo West hoping to do expo and they're doing a mountain one this year out in Colorado. Yeah. Uh, hoping to get out there, you know, I think it's on. still planned. That one hasn't been rescheduled yet. Yeah. They did reschedule Arizona. Yep. That one's been yeah. moved to, I think June or July. Right. So, yeah. uh, and as far as I know, East has not, but that's an October event. So sure. we should be okay on that. But yeah, man. And then getting into the, that community, we were able to talk to a lot of people and then we were finding some guys that um, are going out on these adventures and started teaming up with them in a sense. Our Overland Machete is one of those gotta have pieces of kit in your rig. I, yeah. I, mean, I know you make it, but 
man, if any of you get, you know, you, yourself, you're out wheeling every now and then you don't mind getting something out of the way. You know, and it's funny because I was having this conversation with my wife about a year ago. We're here. We are doing the Mojave road, wide open desert. And we took a detour through a riverbed. And what do you know? I was like, man, I wish I had had a machete here. I am trying to hack back some of these cat's claw bushes with a, a, an ax and it's just not working well. <laughs> uh, that would have been a perfect opportunity. And even in here, wide open desert, that would have been a perfect opportunity to use it. You know, a machete is one of those, whether you're on the farm, you're out camping, even if you just got a clear place to put your tent, yep. you know, some tires are all in the way uh, or clear some stuff to hang a hammock, you know, whatever you're doing, uh, that, that, that kind of stuff always comes in handy. And we have some setups like mine is mounted on the back of the tailgate inside on my Jeep so that I just whip the, the back oh, door yeah. open the machete, take it out, and we can do some stuff with that. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't carry a good axe, too, because, again, there's always that situation oh, yeah. for, you know, the right tool for the right job kind of thing. Yep. Well, yeah. so kind of what's different about uh, the LT Wright knife machete uh, versus some other ones? Um, I don't know about so much as, as different. Uh, one of the things is, is when you do get one of our machetes, you are buying our company in a sense, because these are all handmade in our shop. It's, it's 12 guys. Uh, we're making them right here in the USA, and we 100% stand behind all of our products, period, end of discussion. It's replace, repair, refund. It's one of those things. There's, you're not going to be stuck with something you don't like, um, that's just the way our policy is. We have a great customer service setup. If there ever is a problem, we're very easy to get a hold of by, you know, Facebook, Instagram. We have multiple emails that, and, and the phone. My wife actually answers the phone. We answer it. You don't get a press one for this, press two for that. You get a lady that says, thank you for calling LT right nice. How can we help you? You know, that's so awesome. those are some of the things that are on the back end. The steel we get, um, I buy it from a company called Admiral, and they ship it to us. We have the blanks water jet so that they're all uniform, and then we do the rest of the work, send the heat, or after we get the batch ready, we send them to a company called Peter's Heat Treat, who has done our large batch heat treat since I first started making knives. Brad Stallsmith, personal friend of mine, we've been buddies for a long time. I, you know, I have 100% faith in, in their heat treats. Uh, the other small batch stuff we'll do in-house, and we have two ovens. We do a lot of our own heat treat. We're running our ovens most days. Um, but on something like that, it's a big batch. It's also a big piece, and we, we send them off. But we use 1075. We're, we use a 332nd thick stock. It's nice and flexible, easily sharpened, has a nice, generous handle. Uh, it's got a couple places on it to where you can uh, lanyard, put a lanyard either forward or rear on our machetes. We do a force patina to help keep the rust away. We do an, an apple cider and vinegar patina. And on any uh, carbon tile steel, if you have a knife that's rusting, because this is a question we do get a lot, you know, I got this old knife and I can't keep the rust off of it. Soak it in vinegar, stick it in an old potato, you know, a potato sitting there, let a, a natural patina start occurring on it. It'll help keep the rust off and it'll protect your steel. Huh. So that's one of the things. But our machete, our machete comes in the machete will come in a nice big leather rig that we have made by JRE Industries out of uh, Illinois. Spen, he's a he's a friend of mine. He's been building machines for a long time. Or we do an in-house Kydex rig too. So you have a couple different ways that you can carry it. And like I said, mine actually uh, I have a Molly panel set up on the back of my tailgate, and we just Molly panel you know Molly the Kydex rig right to that, and I can just pop it out when I need it. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, the website, ltrightknives.com right now, looking at the Overland machete. Uh, and there's a number of options. You can buy it without the sheath or with the sheath. And then there's different options on uh, the whether it's the leather or the, the Kydex. So I've got knives that have both. Uh, the, the Genesis knife that I have has the leather sheath, which is great for, you know, when I'm I used that a lot when I was up in Alaska uh, going ice fishing because it was easy to slip it out, do the work, and slip it back in uh, with, you know, even heavy mittens on. I could handle that. Um, but it's not something I would carry on my uh, my kit that I use for the Army just because it doesn't have the same retention. Uh, what are some right. of the other uh, drawbacks or advantages to the different kinds of sheaths? 
Well, and that, you know, those are uh, one of those user preference things. And it truly is because there's not like, oh, leather's bad or oh, Kydex is bad. There, there is a love hate. There are yeah. some guys that hate Kydex, there are guys that hate the leather and, there, and various reasons. And it could be from an experience or something that maybe happened to your knife when it was in this kind of sheet that you just remember like, ah, I don't like that. Hmm. Uh, leather, one of, you know, some of the advantages with our sheets that we sell, like for the Genesis, they usually come in a drop dangler. Now that drop dangler has the ability to go on your belt and have the knife swing. So if you're in and out of your truck a lot, yep. you know, your winch up or helping your, helping your buddy get his truck unstuck, right? Because that's what <laughs> yeah. That's really more that's, likely. That's, that's it. So that's why it doesn't kind of stick in the seat. It'll, it'll swing with you, right? Or if it's in the winter and you've got a heavy coat, like you mentioned Alaska, well, your knife would be down below your coat line in a lot of instances. Yep. Or if you're a backpacker and your belly band, you have your belly band on, that's one of those situations where, well, hey, you know, this is down below that. Now, the hip version of that, which is all in one sheath, that allows you to tuck it up tight up under, say, your coat if you're out hunting or something. You like to have your, your knife right up on your hip. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that would be an advantage of that. Now, also on our leather sheaths, um, again, another advantage to leather is you can wet form that. So you could actually make it like a, a click-in once the leather dries. You just wet it, form it all around the knife. Take the knife out, oil it up, let it dry for a couple of days and put everything back together and you might have a nice. Uh, oh, if I hadn't a, even thought about doing that. Maybe I'll have to try that. Yeah, wet forming it and then just um, we use a lot of ballastol oil on our sheaths, but also like a snow seal. After you get it all wet formed, snow seal that thing oh, yeah. up. Real yeah, those are great. So so leather does have its place. Also on the leather sheaths have a fire steel rod loop. So a lot of times you can have your fire steel and your knife with you at all times. And I, I'm a big fan of having a way to start fire. Like you said, you never know. You get your truck hung up, hung up and, and now you're, what, two days from home, you yep. know, and silly you forgot to tell the wife where you went. Yeah, who knows? But exactly. get to be able to start a fire. So th that, I guess, would be the advantages of leather. Disadvantages, just like you said. Let's say you're you're in another situation. You got to be a little more tactical, or a little quicker access, or you need to deploy your knife quicker. Let's say, you know, um, because retention and deployment are very important. It has to be secure, so your retention has to be spot on, and your deployment needs to be quick enough to where you can access it without hurting yourself and do what you need to do with your knife. And that's where the Kydex stuff comes in. One, Kydex is fantastically Molly, or, you know, for Molly gear. You can put it anywhere you want. Yep. So we we have it set up to where you can use the tech locks, the spider clips. Uh, you can use the ulti clips. You can paracord it with all the open grommets on there. You know, if you wanted to lash it to your your gear, sure. your rig. Kydex also allows you to carry a knife inverted, and in, you know, like if you were wanting a small neck rig, or if it was on the outside of your vest and yep. you needed to deploy it. What we've done is we have a slide lock retention system that we designed years and years ago at Blind Horse. And, and the basic reason was I would end up going to these shows and it was funny, man. It was like, it, this is my Goldilocks story, right? Guy would come up and have a piece of Kydex rig on there. He'd pick it up and he'd like, man, I can't get this out. I'm like, no kidding. He'd walk away and I'd lift it and I'm like, man, this, this works real good. What? I don't know. I get it. Next guy come along, he pulls it. Boy, this thing just don't hold in there very well, does it? You know, again, it depends on who grabbed the knife, the, their, their idea of retention and deployment, where that fell. So I know I'm, I'm, I'm making these mental notes and I'm going, okay, everybody's a little bit different. They, they want that just right for them. Well, how can I do that when, and, and get that to them? Well, that's where the slide lock comes in. The slide lock has about an inch of space with a Chicago screw and a slide rubber grommet in it. So what that does is you can realistically set the tension from extremely loose to basically locked. You can't get it out with that huh. Kydex rig. So making it very personal to you. Sure. That's really interesting. I, I'd never even thought about that adjustability in the retention. That's awesome. Well, see, that was one of the things, and, and this was the beauty of it, because I did do a lot of that person to person early on, I was able to shake hands, look people in the eye, get their feed, whether I liked it or not, get their feedback. Yeah. Because sometimes 
I'd go away grumbling and upset that someone said, oh, you know, this, that, or the other about my knife. And then I go home and go, huh, maybe I better look at what he's talking about. But that's one of the things that came out of being able to be one-on-one with someone because I'm listening to them say, this is, this is loose. This is tight. This is just right. This jiggles. And I'm going, okay, how can I, how can I make this go away for that guy? How can I fix this for the whole product line and make another, sure the best product that we can do. So thank God for that. Yeah. Well, since we're talking about options and feedback from the customers, like I said, I'm looking at the website, ltrightknives.com, and it takes probably 20 scrolls for me to get through all the different varieties of knives that you guys have on here. Like, this is amazing. And I'm sure a lot of it is just personal preference, but uh, there's difference in the like the blade shapes there's difference in the the grinds on the blade like a flat grind or the scandy grind and i don't know the difference between them um, but i'm sure there's a great reason for them can you explain a little bit of that oh absolutely well uh, again early on when i started making knives i kind of considered myself a hunting knife company because that that's really where i knew you know i would go hunting with my dad the most time i ever got to use my knife other than playing with it you know, like we all do at the oh, refiner, yeah. right? Open and close knives um, was field dressing game. You know, going hunting, getting to put it on my hip, whether I I, t- I took a deer that year or not. I got to wear my knife in the wood every day. There I, you I was, go. Sometimes uh, you just take it for a walk. Exactly. <laughs> so that was the the one of the things um, I thought I was the knife, or I'm sorry, I thought it was a hunting knife company, and that's kind of what I started making. Well, a friend of mine named Tim Stester comes up and he goes, "Hey, can you make a a bushcraft knife?" And I'm like, "Sure." Uh, what's bushcraft? You know, <laughs> I, I really was, I was kind of like, I, I don't know what you mean. Oh, it's this, that, you know, we, we started talking about it and I said, yeah, yeah, I guess maybe we could. Well, we started making one of his designs, which was called a bushcrafter. Cause you know, that's all I knew. And it sold quite well. Huh. Well, and we started doing this, this, and then it said, well, that's a flat grind. Can you do it in Scandi? And I was like, sure, let's look into that. So a Scandi is a, uh, v grind or like a chisel grind. So we started teaching ourselves how to scan the grind basically and, and evolved into that. Well, now this time, you know, jump forward to now. And, and, and when we started LT right up again, we, um, we were, we're a bushcraft company. We quickly went from a, what I thought was a hunt knife company to now we have a great reputation and a good brand name in the bushcraft industry. And I'm extremely proud of it. And, and, blessed that so many people liked our stuff that we were able to come into that and and that's kind of where it went so getting back to your question about you know this blade versus this blade there's a lot of multi-levels to that and that could start with the size of the blade the length of the blade that could be is the point center high low is it a clip point there's so many variations is it a flat grind, a hollow grind, a scandy grind, a convex grind, and, and what each one of these are for. So one of the best things when someone does ask me a, a general question, let's say I'm at a show and I go, okay, well, I want this knife that can do all these things. And I said, okay, well, what's the, the main thing you want your knife to do? And if you say to me, man, I do a lot of camping and, you know, I, I really want to be able to process my lunch and cut my steak out of the cast iron skillet off the fire at night. Okay, well then I'm gonna point you to this certain kind of knife. But if you said to me, man, I do a lot of tent steaks and uh, making pot hooks and, and making traps and, and toggles for my hammock and you know a lot of wood process and you know, light baton and uh, feather stick and that kind of stuff. Well, I'm gonna point you to a different knife. Well, that goes back to, well, I wanted one knife to do this, this all these jobs. Well, I understand what you want, but yeah. let's look at it from this kind of point of view. And this is one of the things that I use and everybody seems to understand that it's like having a rifle, a shotgun and a pistol. Okay. They are fantastic tools. If you use them in their right environments. Yep. Okay. If you go elk hunting at a thousand yards with your 12 gauge shotgun, <laughs> you're gonna be upset, but I bet, I bet you don't go tell your buddies, man, this, this shotgun's worthless. I couldn't kill an elk with it. Well, it's a great shotgun in its environment. You used it for the wrong task. Exactly. Well, 
honestly, knives pretty much are in that same category. Now, you can get a knife to do a lot of different things, but it's going to do one thing really, really good. Yep. So that, that's kind of where you're going. And where then you start going into, okay, well, where's my grind choice now? Well, if you're wanting to do some bushcraft, Scandi is a great grind choice. Convex is a great grind choice because there's a lot more steel backing it up. You've got a little more, you know, one of these things going on. If you're going to process game and you're going to, um, you know, cut cheese, you know, you, you're going to want a flat grind or a hollow grind up. Something that has a thin profile that's going to be much easier. I can cut scan or a tomato with scandies, but it sure is a lot easier with a thin flat grind, you know? Yeah. And uh, same with a machete. I don't want to take my small hunting knife out and clear briars. You know, I want that machete with that long blade way out there. So I'm not getting pricked up with those, those thorns and stuff. Exactly. So, and then as far as like the shape of the knife, again, some of that is personal preference. But if you look at our Genesis and our GNS, for example, they're both basically a bushcraft knife and they both have center point blades, but the blade on the Genesis is a little fatter and the GNS is a little longer and thinner. And that honestly is a personal preference thing. We had people saying, man, I like this, but can you make it a little thinner going out there? Okay, well, that's where we had that. Well, I like this handle, this broomstick handle, but can you put a contour in it? so that it fits my hand better. So that's where that comes in. And again, that goes back to, do I like leather or do I like Kydex? That's sure. gonna be a personal preference. If you come by and you handle about four or five knives, you're gonna find that one you like. You know, because now we're, we're really kind of getting into uh, Ford, Chevy, Jeep, Land Rover. Oh, yeah. They're, it's just you know, personal preference. It is. You know, they, they do great, it's just where, where the personal preference is. Sure. And even the finish, there's a, a wide range of options in the finish. Uh, and it, like you said, there's some that look like it's uh, had that force, uh, the, yeah, the patina added to it. Yep. And that just looks awesome. Uh, but it turns out it's actually functional. I didn't think about that. Oh, yeah. Now, we use that finish on our uh, on our 1075 stuff, like our Bushcrafter HCs or the Bush Babies and on the machetes. And realistically, though, you can use it on any carbon, 01, 1095s, any of those series knives that you want to use them for. The cool thing is it's a finish that you can touch up easily because, honestly, all this is is we soak them in apple cider vinegar, and then we take yellow mustard on a sponge and daub it on afterwards, huh. and the mustard is darker than the, the um, vinegar, and it gives you that finish. You could take mustard and write your name on the side of the blade if you wanted to, and the way it you know reacts with the steel and the oxidation, it'll it'll have your name on the side. That's pretty awesome. Well, speaking of touching up, any good knife that gets used a lot is going to need to be resharpened and touch up that blade. Uh, do you have some recommendations or or some good practices for when somebody's trying to touch up and resharpen their blade? Oh yeah. Well, first and foremost, you can always send it back to us. We'd be glad to clean it up for you and sharpen. Oh. So that's no problem at all. But if you're wanting to do some stuff in the field, we actually, on our YouTube channel, we do have some sharpening videos that both touch on at home and in the field. But I'll give you a rundown of some of the things that we do. If, if you're using a blade from us, we put a micro bevel on the end of our edges. Now, we've done that. And the reason we do that is years and years of sending knives out getting feedback and seeing what is the strongest and most stable knife. Because some people say, well, I want mine completely be ground to sharp. Well, I understand that, but we never know where our knives are going. We should, we can have knives going to Alaska. I can have knives going to the Brazilian jungles. You know, I, I don't know. So we have to have this, this universal place where we get the least people, uh, I guess, unhappy. We, we please the most people with the edge retention and how sharp they come right out of the box. So we, we hope and, and, and try for that. So our knives all have a micro bevel on them. Now, the best way for you to do this at home without any machinery is get something similar to like a, a mouse pad and a piece of sandpaper. Okay, and, you, and depending on how bad it is, what grit you may have to start with. And then you can sharpen it. Now, what happens is that mouse paper or mouse pad has enough give, just a little bit of give, that it'll help you get that convex back. Okay. Or you use a piece of leather on a strop and put a piece of sandpaper on your strop, 
and then flip your straw over at the end and drop your edge up real nice. So that's one of the best ways to home. Like if you don't have uh, w- those work sharp machines and stuff that they sell, yeah, they're actually a, a little tiny belt sander. And that's a great way. If you're skilled at doing that, I would suggest that you practice on your, your wife's cheap kitchen knives before <laughs> you put your good knife on something like oh, yeah. that. Just make sure you can do it good. Yep. But that, that's great. I didn't realize I could just send it back and, uh, as long as I don't need to use it right away, because you know it probably takes a little bit of time to get it back. Five of them. If you have four or five, that's fine. Just there send one in. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep them in a rotation. That's it. Yeah. Well, that's all great information. Uh, so now I'm kind of curious. You got to tell me about this Jeep that you've got. Artemis Overland Hardware is a local family-run business that supplies your adventures. They have a brick and mortar store located in Springfield, Missouri, where you can come in and browse the huge selection of equipment. And when I say the selection is huge, I mean it's huge. Artemis Overland Hardware has a large chunk of catalog available from Oztent, 230, Easy On, Snowmaster Fridges, and one of my personal favorites, the Timbo Tusk, the whole brand, but for sure the Scottle. We've got Covia, Front Runner, Alu Cab, Eye Camper, Come Up Winches, Factor 55, Crazy Beaver Tools, National Luna, Red Arc, Iron Man 4x4, and Goose Gear. This isn't just a long list of reputable brands. Artemis Overland Hardware is all about building relationships. Relationships with customers are absolutely important, and your satisfaction is only able to be guaranteed because of the relationship and trust that has been fostered between Artemis Overland Hardware and all of these brands. During this COVID-19 lockdown period, the showroom is unfortunately closed, but ArtemisOverland.com is open for business and orders are shipping like normal. If you have any questions, you can still call and talk to Aaron and his team. Check out ArtemisOverland.com and get equipped and ready for all your adventures, wherever they may take you. That's ArtemisOverland.com, A-R-T-E-M-I-S, Overland.com. Check them out. And hit them up on social media to say thanks for their continued partnership with the 4x4 podcast. Yeah, well, that's all great information. Uh, So now I'm kind of curious. You got to tell me about this Jeep that you've got. Okay. Well, I've always, when the the JK format came out, I, the very first time I saw it, I wanted one. Prior to that, I had a 1998 Jeep Cherokee, and it was a stick shift truck. With the inline six, you know, the I mean, great combo. Great, I'm liking that's it so far. Me, man. I put, uh, I think when I got rid of it, it had 360 some thousand miles on that motor. I sold it to my nephew. He ran it for probably a year, sold it again. And it, to my knowledge, that truck is still running. Okay. So I put 33s on that. Uh, the Bushwhacker fender flares, uh, rough country four inch lift, really didn't do any wheeling with it. So it was time I, I made the decision to like, okay, I'm doing it. So I sold my nephew the Cherokee and went out and bought a 2016 JK Sport and uh, four door white. And I was like, okay, this is, I'm going to build this truck, but I want I didn't want to get a Rubicon. Uh, I'm looking at the, the money difference. And I was like, you know, I probably would want to change the gears and stuff later on. Let me just go my way and, and get this. Sure. So, Got that. They made a deal with me to put on the lift kit for very inexpensive money. I was like, okay, well, then I got to let this happen. So I bought a two and a half inch lift off of AEV, had it installed at the dealership. So I was like, okay. I got some of the AEV rims, um, put a set of 33 1250s on that, and it stayed that way for, oh, 2016, 17, 18. Yeah. And then, um, started building it up well again going to these overland shows there's so much stuff there oh that, yeah that needed to be on my truck right and i was like oh <laughs> no. so i have a cargo master safari congo rack on it which is a great rack i really like this thing i had their side steps on there for a while um i have the the trucks stickered up now sometimes there's pictures of it on the website um i've got knives all down the side of it and right now it has 35 1250 BFGs um, mud terrains on it. We are still running the two and a half inch lift. But in the meantime, we've upgraded the gears. I'm running now 456s front and rear. It still has the Dana 30 in the front. Yep. And put um, Eaton E lockers front and back. 
I bought it with a, uh, when I did get it, it did have the tow package, so it had a limited slip in it. But man, this um, this setup is so much nicer. And yeah. I have, uh, you know, the switch pod in it that I have some, some exterior lights. I got Poison Spider front and rear bumpers. I got the Poison Spider fender flares that we put on this past summer. Um, got some stuff inside, a drawer system in the back now. It's got CB, you know, um, just some different things. And I got all the Blue Ridge Overland gear. Oh, yeah. The anything they made for a Jeep is on my truck. I got the attic. I got the seat backs. I got the, the uh, fire extinguisher covers. Um, I have onboard air now. Um, we did a buy air. And what we did is we put the tank. My buddy Mike goes, man, this is, this is going to be cool. Why don't you do this? Because, again, at the time, I still have to go get groceries with my wife. I still got to get to shows, so I have to put a bunch of knife stuff. So I, I, could, I had to make it to where I could get all this stuff still carrying it in the Jeep. So we mounted the compressor on one tube and the air tank on the other down tube. And everything goes up under the foam roll pads. Okay. So that's what my onboard system is right now. That's pretty um, slick. At present time, we have brand new axles sitting at my buddy Andy's house ready to go in. I got a truss system for the front. Uh, differential and we are building rock sliders hopefully depending on what's going on with the world in the next sure. two months hopefully by summer we have a set of rock sliders built he's got them built for his scout right now and they look really great plus they hold air so we're going to have additional air storage um yeah it's a good time we yeah. uh we we spent some time hung up here not that long ago it had been raining over here in Ohio and West Virginia like crazy and I have some property in West Virginia. So me, my buddy Andy, my nephew Sam, and my buddy Grant, we all went wheeling. And man, it was like, we can't even get out of the field. I am not kidding you. It is <laughs> just sloppy. It was, we spent most of the day winching and max tracking. Oh, man. It was, it was a good time, but it was cold and wet. And it was still a good time. Yeah. Yeah, man, it was so much fun, and uh, we just had a an absolute blast. But we've been we've been doing uh, the build up for you know our uh, like I said, Scott and Sam both have Tacomas that are pretty built, and my buddy Andy's got his Scout build up, and, and my buddy Grant's got his Tacoma. He's building it up, so we're just having fun, adding things to our rigs and and getting out when we can. Sure. So you you said you got the AEV lift kit on that one. Is that the uh -huh. the dual sport? Or the dual, yeah, dual sport, I think is what they call it. Uh, the two and a half inch. It's got I like know. a, the coils have a different spacing between them, uh, different points in the spring. Okay, I'm going to have to Ooh. call. So, I let, don't know. Tell me how you like it, because I think that's the only lift kit that they make in that size. Uh, okay. The two and a half, well, the thing was, again, we still pull the trailer with that Jeep sometimes. Yeah. And the fact that like where I am in Ohio, I do so much road driving. As much as I would love to tell you, 90% of the time it's in the mud. It's not. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's, not. it's my daily driver. When we go to Atlanta for shows, when we go to Virginia, it's, you know, 70 mile an hour down the highway. Yeah. So I didn't want, you know, 40-inch tires and, and a, a six-inch lift. Well, let me say that. I do want that, but <laughs> at this time, it Sometimes. was Sometimes... Sometimes you got to make the logical choice in life. Exactly. So there you go. Yeah. That's like 456s. I wanted 488s, but 456s were a little oh, yeah. more friendly with 35s. So I kind of I kind of went that way. Because, again, I spent a lot of time doing 70 mile an hour down the highway. So I, I got to get that. So as for that, yeah, it's a great suspension. I am very happy with it. Uh, great on-road and even off-road. I've not gotten a situation thank God that I went, man, this is, I wish I was way higher and it flexed more. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not a crazy off-roader as I go either. But. Well, you know, like off-road vehicles are like lives and knives in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah. Each one is, has a, it's a tool for the job. So maybe you just need to have another one. Well, as we were talking earlier about <laughs> the grill trucks, uh, the, I, I can't help but look right. You know, yeah. I have, the, but I have to say, you know, one of my grill trucks is my JK because I wanted a JK, honest to goodness, the very first time. Well, I was in love with the LJs. Remember the old LJ? Oh, yeah. Oh, how can you not like that truck? Yep. Well, they discontinued it, and they came out with the four-door unlimited, 
I was like, this is it, man. This Because I, I had a four-door Cherokee at the time. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is kind of like a big Cherokee. I'm real, I'm, And I can take the top off. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm in. Right? I'm, I'm totally on board. So I waited till 2016, till the timing was right. And I was like, okay, I'm doing it now. And I, I still love my truck. That's I, awesome. I, I well, uh, so, you know, the Grail trucks, we were talking about that uh, before we started recording here. And I, I heard the discussion on the, the podcast that you guys have started. Mm-hmm. How's that one going? Uh, yeah, man, we're having a, a lot of fun. We, it's called The Shack, and you can access it from our website or Facebook, Instagram. Uh, it's, and it's us guys. We talk trucks. We talk knives. We just taped one uh, and just uploaded it yesterday on Camp Cooking. Okay. How we eat when we're at camp, and we've talked about. Uh, I think we did a two-parter on knives and cheese because we, you know, we got long-winded when we get to talk about knives. <laughs> My truck knowledge, man, it would be a short show. I, I pretty much I gave you everything I knew right there in that two. <laughs> so that's it, you know. Um, but the, the the fun factor of, of getting us guys together and, and having a few minutes to talk them, and, and that's what it is, man. We're sitting, honest to goodness, we're sitting around the old kitchen table that used to be in the house here when we had the company and I was running it from the basement, we had about 10 people working in my house at one time before we moved to the shop. And my wife wanted that kitchen table because it had all our, you know, we'd come up for lunch and we're greasy. Yeah. It was looking. So it ended up going to shop when it, and it's still in there today. And we sit at that table and do our podcast from that. So it's a bunch of fun, man. That's awesome. If, yeah. If you get your listeners, get a chance to tune in. We appreciate it, man. Absolutely. I'll have a, a link on the show notes for sure. So everybody can just, once they're finished, listen to this discussion, hop on over and uh, listen to the shack. Oh yeah. We appreciate it. Well, let me ask you something. Sure. What's your grail truck? Oh man. Um, so I, I would not have just one. Uh, there was probably a few. I would have a choice for a full size. I've definitely wanted to get into a uh, one of the JKs, the unlimited ones. And now the, the Gladiator is very nice, uh, very appealing. The problem with the Cherokee, uh, and that's why I talked my wife in getting to the 1500 that we have, the Ram 1500, is that right. you can't put a dead animal in the back of a Cherokee without making a mess of things. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that, that's that, also to, an excuse to get an overland trailer. It, well, and that's true. Uh, I did build a trailer as well, but it, again, it's uh, probably not a great just general cargo carrying type thing. Uh, but you know that truck was less than seven days old before I had a dead caribou laying in the back. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> nice. Uh, so yeah, the the idea of a jeep with an open bed that I could just easily hose out—that's pretty appealing. Uh, so that's pretty high on my list. Yeah. Um, but were, you know. Were you a fan- uh, the old J trucks were you a fan of that? oh yeah absolutely every time i see one online i'm like uh maybe i can pitch this to my wife see what she thinks and uh time's not hey, right yet i gotta get more kids out of the house around here the sad thing is man they, they were rusty you yeah know? ohio pa west virginia yeah and that just did not hold up there's not many nice units around here that you could end up getting yeah well here i am now in southern california where rust is almost non-existent all right so there's tons of project rigs that are just in pretty good shape just need a little bit of elbow grease and some tender love Uh, just the other day i saw a vw uh the baja bug somebody had a project that was kind of stalled and they were giving it away for a song it was like two thousand bucks for a a running mostly running Baja bug. Oh, right. That'd be a good time out here in the desert. I love seeing the the class 11 race uh, vehicles, the, the VW bugs running the Baja 1000. And yeah. Man, there's just too many good options out there. So that would be, if I had a bottomless, uh, a giant pile of money, I would turn it into a garage full of cars. <laughs> no, doubt. no doubt. See, being in Southern California, you're right. See, like my grail trucks, I almost have to think of fiberglass tub stuff. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and go that direction because I like some of the old stuff. Yep. Um, but yeah, I could see where man, you could get some old willies, and there's a, there's a lot. Yep. As long as you're ready to buy one that's going to take a lot of work, it, it can be pretty reasonable. But every now and then, I'll see, you know, just like a CJ5 or CJ7 that's been mildly restored, and they're selling them for like fifteen, eighteen, twenty some thousand dollars. Like holy smokes, that's. Oh, yeah. You know, orders of magnitude more expensive than it was when it was new. Yeah. 
And you know, I, I'm I'm not a mechanic guy by any means. I always wished I I was. I never took the time to just to to learn it out. I, I you know my buddy Andy's heck. I just learned how to weld this year. You know, oh wow! Well, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to learn how yeah. to weld. That was one of my cool things. Um, so I got to be on a, a bumper build. Got to see how that was going together. Got to grind the, the welds off. Yay! <laughs> but no, that was it. Was a good you know good learning experience. But I'll tell you what and. and you probably know this too. YouTube is such an oh, amazing yeah. nowadays when you're when you are working on a project. For instance, we were trying to figure out how to get the door. We had some steps on the side of my Jeep, and again, I live in the Rust Belt, sure. and they were bolted through the door hinges, and we couldn't get the the uh, hinge out. I couldn't figure out how to get the door card off the inside of the JK. Absolutely not my idea. My yeah. nephew, we're looking at this thing. He's going, he's got no idea. Pulls out an iPad, types it into YouTube, and in two minutes has that thing off because someone has posted a video on how to do this. Yeah. It is an amazing how much you can find on YouTube that you can DIY your rigs, even beyond what you thought you could do. Oh, yeah. Wiring. There, I mean, there's some projects on there. I watched and I go, you know, I think I can do this. Yep. And it, if you can't find it on YouTube, it's probably not possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, the other side of that, just for a, like, let's say you can't get out right now, man, watching people go on trips and getting, you know, winching techniques and how to videos and uh, man, some of my favorite guys are the Australian wheelers. Oh yeah. Dude, how fun is that? Just watching this stuff over and over and over. Yep. We live a good time right now, man. Yeah, minus the fact that we're trapped inside our houses, and I guess we have bottom unlimited time to now watch all those videos. And <laughs> yeah, this is this is when you do your online shopping and put everything in your cart that you oh, need yeah. for that next project. Probably well, shop day. today's payday. Now it's time to go start putting some things in it from that shopping cart and actually buying them. Oh, there you go. That's yeah. my plan for the afternoon. <laughs> and, yeah, and, I, and I'll buy stuff and I'll set it on my. Uh, shelf at work and it's like this future project yeah uh, and they get so many of them up there and then you start dwindling them down one by one that's kind of what we did there we were getting pretty good we had a really good winter we worked on our trucks real good this year and i was so happy and then kind of hit this brick wall for a few weeks here yeah. sadly you know uh it, it is what it is Hope we'll, we'll get through it you know we'll, we'll go away all right. Well, uh, so I've really enjoyed our time together, LT. Uh, if somebody wants to follow along and, and see what all you guys are up to uh, once life restarts, where should they go to keep up with everything LT Right Knives? Oh, definitely Instagram. Um, check out the uh, Facebook page. We also do have a private forum. It's called our Pout House. Uh, it's a $20 a year membership, and we have our own forum in there and a bunch of guys in there that are doing really cool stuff and uh, you know, we talk knives, guns, trucks, uh, buy, sell, trade. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Just a good group of guys. We've raised money for charities. It, it's just a, a real nice hangout place. Awesome. Uh, they, they get together and go camping, do a lot of that kind of stuff. So you can, so Facebook, Instagram um, are the best places. By all means, if you're ever in Ohio, come by, take a shop tour. We'd love to do that. Absolutely. But we also uh, check out our event page, and, and uh, we do try to get out to a lot of events naturally this this couple months that we're going through right now everything is getting thrown farther out so i don't know honestly what the the rest of the year we're gonna have to get it sorted out before we know where we're at for sure um but you know there's a lot of things getting canceled moved yeah. around yeah but we will be places you're always welcome to come by the shop man hit us up drop us some private messages check out our youtube we always like having trying to have fun and check out our podcast you know for you know, sure and, I, and I appreciate you for listening to it brother i, I appreciate that yeah i know it's definitely i mean i got a lot of podcasts i'm subscribed to but uh that's a fun one to listen to thanks a lot all right well i appreciate your time lt uh and i look forward to uh sometime when we can cross paths at one of the events or on the trails or maybe a shop tour you got it all right we'll talk to you later thank you man Thanks again, LT, for your time on the podcast. Uh, looking forward to whenever we get to to meet up in person and swap some stories, and uh, maybe cook out something at the at the campfire.
Anyways, want to remind you that we are proud members of the 4x4 Radio Network. Head over to 4x4radio.com, and there you'll find the huge playlist with all the shows from the 4x4 Radio Network. You can listen to the Center Steer podcast, learn about Land Rovers, Jeep Talk Show, uh, learn about all things Jeep-related. We've got Cody and Matt over at Trail Chasers Podcast, and lastly, On the Trail with Kevin and Scott. Thanks again to Artemis Overland Hardware for helping this show continue. Be sure to check them out on Facebook, Instagram, and of course at ArtemisOverland.com. And uh, they've got their newly expanded space there in Springfield, Missouri. If you have any feedback regarding anything you heard on this show, uh, just check out our show notes at uh, the4x4podcast.com slash 154. And if you want to share this episode, just the episode, you can do that. No show notes, just the audio at the 4 x 4 podcastcom slash 154MP3. You can send that to all your friends and let them hear, you know, maybe send it to your, your significant other. Let them know what's on your wish list there uh, from LT Right Knives. Uh, you can send us some feedback. You can email us, uh, the 4 x 4 podcast at yahoo.com. On Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, we are all at the 4 x 4 podcast there. You can leave us a voicemail, 719-924-5337, or use the speak pipe tool that's available there on the show notes page. But now it's time to hit the trails, so tread lightly, God bless, and stay safe while exploring your world. <laughs>